Hello again, everyone. Hello and welcome, and thank you for uh, attending today's Action Pack Network sponsored webinar with Cisco Systems. Uh, my name is Ray Adolko, and I'm with Action Pack Networks, and I'll be your host during the next 60 minutes. We're really proud and very privileged to have Mr. Amar Akhtar here from uh, Cisco, who will be sharing information with us today on how Cisco MediaNet can help optimize networks for video, voice, and data, while at the same time help reduce costs. Before we begin today's session, there are a few things that I'd like to mention. Uh, first is that I'd like to inform you that uh, today's recording of the webinar, as well as the presentation, will be made available, and that we will be circling back with you to provide information on where to view the video and download the presentation. Um, I'd also like to uh, say that this is an interactive session, and so please feel free to submit any questions you may have in the chat window. And since uh, we do have a team of subject matter experts here to answer your questions, uh, I do want to let you know, though, that we will not be opening the phone lines during this session. Uh, following Amr's informative presentation, we'll have a brief question and answer period where he can field some of your questions. Now I'd like to introduce the presenter for today's event, Mr. Amr Akhtar, Technical Marketing Engineer with Cisco. He has over 14 years of experience in the networking industry and is responsible for deployment and technical marketing for enterprise media net systems. He's also the architect for the media net video monitoring solution. Previously, Amory had been responsible for the performance routing, WAN optimization systems, video systems, routing protocols, NBAR, and NetFlow. He joined Cisco in the Technical Assistance Center, or TAC, and was worked in various capacities for Cisco, supporting large service provider and enterprise customers by testing, designing, deploying Layer 2 and MPLS VPN networks. Thanks again, Amar, for joining us here today. I'd like to take this opportunity now to, to turn it over to you. Thanks, Ray. So good morning, good afternoon, um, and, a, and I guess maybe good evening for, for some folks. So my name is Amar Akhtar. Uh, I'm one of the technical marketing engineers for the MediaNet program. We'll talk about what MediaNet means and, and the rest of that stuff. So let's get started. So what I really wanted to sort of set the bar first is um, what, what do we actually mean by video, right? So in the case of, of MediaNet, video actually means a, a, a number of different types of things. It could be video coming from an IP, uh, a hard IP tele and telephone. It could be coming from a soft client. And it doesn't even have to be like a Cisco soft client. I mean, the, we'll talk a little bit about MediaNet and is it for Cisco equipment or non-Cisco equipment. And the answer is it's for both. And there's other types of video equipment, for example, telepresence units, these immersive systems with, you know, uh, three screens, four screens, that type of stuff. Then there's also the WebEx conference systems, like the one that we're on right now. There's a very strong video component that's part of that. So if you've uh, been on a WebEx meeting that has the high-quality video component, uh, you can actually get 720p um, quality video, uh, 30 frames per second, as part of uh, as part of a WebEx session as well. And then, of course, there's the hard endpoints, the you know the EX90 series from the Cisco's Tanberg acquisition, as well as you know uh, EX60s and things of that nature. Then there's all sort forms of uh, other video systems, for example, for video on demand, um, YouTube type stuff, video for training. Uh, a lot of companies do um, uh, town hall meetings. Uh, sometimes using IPTV where the executive wants to present to all the employees and things like that. So all, there's all sorts of video that's going over the network. And what's, what, what Cisco has seen over the last several years is that when it comes to video, there's all sorts of requests that are basically coming in from all sorts of places inside the enterprise. So there could be employees that are trying to do PC-based video conferencing or uh, video for training purposes. Then there's departments in the Cisco cafeterias. We use digital signage to basically um, congratulate people that perhaps you know got their CCI, CCIEs recently or display the menu. We could also we also use it for video surveillance within Cisco and a lot of other companies. And then there's cases where the executives, like I was talking about, use executive um, broadcasts for town hall meetings and basically trying to reach out and connect to the their global employees. Now, all these different types of videos are going to be touching the same network a lot of times. And what's happening is that your the IT resources, the network side, as well as on the application side, are being stretched. And from our discussions from the customers, from enterprise uh, network operators as well as application operators, there's a lot of anxiety about how to go about uh, basically deploying, how to think about going, uh, doing these types of deployments, how to manage these deployments, how to provide SLAs 
for these types of deployments. So that's really where the MediaNet program came from. So the types of things that we're trying to address with the MediaNet uh, program, uh, firstly, is deployment. So try to make deployment a whole lot easier, be able to um, test the network, for example, to assess network readiness. We'll talk about tools for that. Another big part of MediaNet is helping out with operations. So being able to tell that there's something wrong with a particular video conference call or with an IPTV session uh, before the user actually calls in and complains and says, look, there's something wrong with my video. Can you please fix it? So we have tools that can uh, tell you before the fact that something is wrong and get you a head start in being able to try to resolve that problem. And then finally, uh, we also have tools to be better able to map the users to an experience. So to be able to say that this is coming from a scheduled conference room or this is coming from a hard endpoint or this is coming from, um, uh, uh, you know, from the CEO's office and to be able to provide those type of users with additional uh, quality of services to be able to have a better quality for these, for these different types of, of, of high priority users. Now, when it comes to meeting it, uh, MediaNet is not a product, so it's not a box or anything like that that you would go buy. Uh, Cisco makes tons of boxes, but MediaNet in itself is not a box. Think of it as perhaps a set of features, but what I like to talk about it is MediaNet is a foundational architecture that has elements of QoS, it has elements in monitoring, it has elements in how you go out and do deployments. It, it has elements in best practices, and we've actually published these best practices out on CCO. So if you do a search for um, solution readiness design guides and MediaNet, you'll see a, a number of design guides on how to go out and, for example, design a MediaNet QoS network. Okay? So the way to think about MediaNet is uh, best practices and architecture, a number of different types of features, some of them existing, some of them uh, improved features, and we've also have, we've got completely new features that were created out of the MediaNet program as well. The three main verticals within MediaNet, and this maps back to you know those three problem areas that I, was, that I talked about on the previous slide, A, we're trying to accelerate the automatic plug and play. So basically making application deployment, application onboarding, a lot more accelerated than it is today. So if you're familiar with how a Cisco IP phone gets onto the network today, um, you can take a Cisco IP phone out of the Cisco you know, packaging right from the factory, plug it into a Cisco switch. The switch will recognize it as a phone. It will reconfigure the port for that particular phone for the best practices for a phone, put it into a voice VLAN, data VLAN, all that stuff. And within a couple of seconds, the phone uh, can be uh, allocated a dial number, and you can even start making PSTN calls or even 911 calls if your call manager is configured in that particular way. So that was a very Cisco-specific uh, application to network integration. We've expanded that feature using, uh, there's a feature called Auto Smart Ports. So you can take an HP printer, plug it into a Cisco switch. The switch will recognize it as an HP printer. It will reconfigure that particular port to that uh, best practice for that device. And it's not a best practice determined by Cisco. We have, we certainly have best practices, uh, and some of these are baked into the switches. But the network operator is free to choose their own best practice. So they can create a template on the switch itself, and that template would be pushed down to that switch configuration. And if the user ever unplugs that HP printer, it would go back to its default state. So that's just one example of, what we're, of the types of things that we're doing in the plug and play area. Another portion of MediaNet, another vertical, is something called media monitoring. And this is the area where we're trying to be able to do fault detection, to be able to determine that there's a problem within the network, be able to identify that there is a problem, be able to identify the location of that problem, and be able to do fault isolation, to be able to say, you know what, there is a problem, and it's not on the network, it's actually within the endpoints. So there's something going on in the endpoints that's causing this particular type of quality issue. Or there could be an entirely different type of problem where it is within the network, and in those cases we can even tell you the problem is actually happening, let's say, within the service provider, or it's happening in the North American division of that particular company versus the European division. So uh, fault isolation is another part of media monitoring. And then finally, the, the third public area of, of MediaNet today is something called media awareness. And, uh, the, air, the idea over here is to basically be able to present to the network additional information about the flows that are going across the network. And the reason you, you may want to do that is because you want to be able to differentiate these flows or just to provide better visibility for these flows. To be able to say that particular flow is coming from the CEO's office, we really want to perhaps uh, 
provide some greater quality of service or quality of experience for that flow. Or that particular call is going outside the company, so we want to protect it because it's a partner call or it's a or it's an outside the company call as opposed to somebody calling in, uh, you know, within the company. So all sorts of uh, policies can be created within the network once you understand the context of the application usage. Finally, um, a couple of things to understand about media. So kind of our guiding principles when we design these features, when we, when we put these things together, uh, the most important thing that, that we think about is not to ask the network operator or the application operator for a flag day, to be able to say, today's the day we're gonna, where we're going to basically seize all operations and we're going to do all these mass upgrades, uh, either with hardware or with software, and then magically at the end of that day we'll have a media net. So that's not what we're asking for at all. There's things that you can do, uh, minute changes, just perhaps in some cases it might be a software upgrade or one or two routers that will allow you to see the benefits of MediaNet. There's other cases where you may not even need to make any changes onto the network and the changes are completely on the perimeter of the network where the applications, uh, where the endpoints join the network and it's an application thing. So MediaNet could perhaps be an application thing as opposed to a network thing. That said, uh, the features are also designed in such a way that if you have a median at endpoint, let's say an EX90, talking to a median at enabled network, let's say a CAT3K or 4K or an ISR, G1 or G2, those, those, that's the best case, that you're going to see the full benefit of median at when there's a balance between what's going on in the application and what's going on within the network. Okay. So uh, I'd like to do a little pull at this point just to sort of figure out where people are as far as um, on, the, on the deployment scale. So I'm going to just read these out and then maybe wait a couple of seconds and then move on and then we'll, we'll get your poll results and we'll talk about it in, in a little while. So uh, if you're in the evaluating for, the for a video deployment, then you would click that one. The second case is you're in some sort of limited beta trials of an application. You're sort of kicking the triers to try to see what the adoption rate is for a particular set of users. Are they happy with this? Is there something that they need? Or is the network perhaps able to handle what, what these limited set of users are trying to be able to do? Um, another case could be the application is rolled out and now you're in sort of a month by month increasing the user base. And that's kind of where Cisco is right now. Um, it's, it's actually, we're expanding the user base, but also we're also in the next stage, which is at this point, Cisco actually considers video to be business critical, or at least certain types of video to be business critical. So if, for example, the telepresence uh, network or the video conferencing, the official video conferencing network within Cisco goes down, uh, it is treated as a, as a business uh, issue at that point. Because we have all sorts of calls going on internally, but also with our partners and with, and with key customers and things. And then finally, uh, there's a case where when we've run this into, into a number of different customers is that there's a desire from the users and from the business side to do a video deployment, but either because of, of lack of funding or because of network design issues or because of uh, just sort of, uh, sometimes we run into analysis par paralysis type situations, there's a desire to do the video deployment, but it's just not moving forward because there's, there's a lot of concerns. Um, there's, there's a lot of inactivity and things like that. So you could be stuck in any one of these cases. Or, or, or you could be in any one of these. So I'm going to just keep moving forward. And after a while, we'll, we'll publish the results and we can talk about them. So a while back, I talked about media that exists on the endpoints themselves. Right? So the way that we're actually going to be providing endpoint, and what I mean by endpoint is things like the Cisco Jabber, EX90s, uh, in fact, even Citrix Zen Server and Zen Desktop. So if you've been paying attention on, on the PR Newswire, uh, we recently announced an agreement with Citrix where Citrix would actually be incorporating parts of MediaNet. And the way Citrix is doing this is actually uh, by way of something called the MSI. And the MSI, think of it as a software stack that's incorporated with, with the application. So it's part of Cisco Jabber, it's part of the EX90, it's part of WebEx, for example. And it provides a number of different services, both to the application but really it's meant for the network and application operator. So it's able to do things like, let's say, neighbor discovery. It runs a CDP and LLDP stack, so, and it has a management um, interface. So you can come in and query Cisco Jabber, for example. Uh, well, what are you connected to? What type of device are you connected to? Are you connected to a switch? What's the port number on that switch? And at the same time, we enhance 
CDP and LLDP on the switch side to be able to convey geographic as well as civic location. So what I mean by civic location is that I'm in, I'm in Raleigh, and I'm in North Carolina, here's my address, here's the cube number that I'm in, here's the patch panel that I'm in. So the switch can actually convey that, but also I can choose to convey latitude and longitude over to the device. There's all sorts of other things the MSI can do. Uh, for example, media monitoring, we'll be talking about that. It's able to do host monitoring, so CPU statistics, memory statistics of the host uh, where, where it's running, all sorts of things like that. We have this working for Windows. We're working on a, on integration for um, a Jabber for the Macintosh. We also have it working for Linux, and next year we'll have it available for the mobile OSs, so things like the iPad, the iPhone, the Android devices. Now the key problem areas as far as the media monitoring vertical that we're trying to address, um, they're in the area of visibility, operational diagnostic information, and network assessments for video. So when I talk about visibility, what I'm, talk what I'm saying is that we're able to actually tell you information about who's talking to who, um, how much data is being transferred back and forth, and sometimes even some additional data about what type of applications are, are being conveyed over the network, who are the users behind those applications, what type of uh, of the application context is going on. For example, uh, what's the dial numbers that are being used and things like that. So in some cases, we augmented existing technologies like NetFlow and NBAR, uh, which is a deep packet inspection engine from Cisco, and we'll talk about that. But we also created an entirely new technology called MediaNet Metadata. In the area of operational diagnostic information, uh, we created two entirely new features. One is called Performance Monitor which has the ability to be able to look at the user traffic, analyze it, and to be able to report on the quality of that traffic. And then there's another uh, feature called Media Trace, which is modeled um, after trace route, except it, it brings forth a lot more information about the nodes that your particular flow that you're troubleshooting from the individual network nodes, which can, in fact, include layer two nodes as well. So imagine doing something like a trace route, but you're able to get back uh, loss information from the nodes along the path, but also discovery of layer two switches along the path as well. And then finally, for the network assessment, we augmented the existing IPSLA feature, uh, which I'm sure many of you guys are already using for jitter probes and things like that, uh, to, but to be able to generate synthetic traffic that looks like video traffic. So imagine that you're about to do a big video deployment, all right? And, and, and I can see that I'm looking at the poll results right now, and about 33% of you are in that particular state. And, or you're in, uh, and I would say more than 70% uh, of you are actually in a state where you're doing these deployments, but you'd like to find out. You need to have some sort of assurance that you're going to turn up this new application on this new branch. What is the effect going to be from turning on this new application at this branch? So well, that's exactly the answer that IPS Liberty Operation is, is going to be able to provide. It stresses the network with the same packet size to uh, you know, diff distribution with the same bit rate, the same packet rate as an actual application would, and you're able to basically see if your QoS policies are strong enough, if your a business traffic can be properly protected from your video traffic. So we'll talk about IPS live video operation in, in a bit as well. Okay, so the first feature I wanted to talk about is um, something I'm sure lots of you are already familiar with, something called iOS NetFlow. And the idea with NetFlow is to be able to provide something akin to a phone bill. So it's basically the idea from the routers and from the switches, they look at the traffic that's traversing them, IPA, talking to IPB, using these particular port numbers. And it, and, you know, it has this, it's using up this much bandwidth, here's the, uh, here's the packet sizes, here's the, the bit rate, and here's the packet rate. And it's able then collect all this information from all these routers and switches and send it over to something called a NetFlow collector. And in fact, Action Pact has a product called Live Action that does exactly that. And you, from there, you're able to basically see where the consumers are of data and who are the generators of data. And this allows you to create what we call uh, is a traffic matrix, which is very important as part of capacity planning. If you're able to see, here's where the traffic is being generated, here's where it's being consumed, then the problem becomes of, well, how much bandwidth do we need between these particular sites? How much bandwidth do we need between Hong Kong and London? How much bandwidth do we need between New York and San Antonio? So you can answer those types of questions. And you can start doing, um, and this was exactly what Cisco IT does, you can start doing historical analysis. You can start seeing that, okay, on a month-by-month -month basis, this particular site is increasing its use of video on, you know, uh, by 2% every year, right? So 
when it starts reaching 75% of an interface utilization, you can say, well, we need to start taking some action. We need to start looking at optimizing that traffic, either by throwing away traffic, maybe having better QS policies, or by deploying some sort of caching device, like a WAS or some sort of web cache device or something like that. But it all starts with the analysis that comes from NetFlow, being able to understand who's talking to who and what is the composition of that traffic. Right? Because regular uh, just IP statistics from an interface will tell you how loaded that interface is, but NetFlow will tell you who's talking to who and what the composition of that interface is, of that traffic is, I'm sorry. Now the next portion of that, talking about composition of traffic, what NetFlow would have given you is port numbers, IPA talking to IPB with these particular port numbers. What NBAR does for you, and this is available on the ISR and on the ASR uh, 1000, and it's able to look inside those packets and it's able to tell you that, look, this particular traffic is video traffic and actually, you know what, it's actually Google Talk traffic or it's Skype traffic. Uh, we, it's e even able to tell you the difference, for example, in the WebEx case, the difference between the desktop share and audio integrated with WebEx or the video integrated with WebEx. So those are the levels of distinctions in certain cases that just looking at that traffic, we're able to tell you the difference. There's um, there's there's uh, there's a integration between NBAR and NetFlow, where inside of NetFlow we can actually advertise the name of the application. Right. So not only do you know by the port number sometimes what this particular application is, but now the router and the switches by analyzing that particular traffic, we're able to tell you. Yes, in fact, this is Google traffic, even though uh, Google talk traffic or Google video traffic, uh, be, even though it's going over port 80 or, or going over port 443. Because a lot of times what happens with these applications is they wind up using the, um, uh, the, uh, the web, the HTTP protocols, and disguising themselves as other, other applications. But by looking at that traffic, we can actually tell you what, what, what application these guys are in fact. Another area of being able to inspect that traffic is a very different model from the deep packet inspection case is something called flow metadata. So this is a new thing that we've come out with. It's been out for about seven, eight months now. And the idea here is that we will explicitly just tell the network what this particular flow is. So think about, you know, we talked about the MSI a while back where the MSI is integrated with the application. So the MSI knows that this particular five tuple, this particular IP source, IP destination with these port numbers is this particular application. It has these properties It's coming from this user. And what we can then do is basically announce and project that information into the network. And now the network can actually take these attributes and drive the policy based on these attributes. So in this case, uh, Jabber for Windows is basically projecting into the network saying this particular flow, um, you know, 38.183 talking to 1.2 is Jabber for Windows. It's the audio leg. It's coming from a software phone. And in fact, it's coming from Jabber 9.0. There's um, additional enhancements to this where we, we, where we even have the URIs, so we know who's talking to who. Uh, we know what number was dialed, you know, that type of information. So based on that, within the network, we can drive QoS policies on this. Uh, for some of this information, we can actually even export it via NetFlow and make it available in the same way that NBAR would have made this available, except now it's a lot more detailed information. It's coming from a slightly different source, namely, the, the application itself. So this feature is called media metadata. Now, a lot of times what happens when you're doing this type of classification, whether it's coming from NBAR or from, or from metadata, and sometimes people wind up using access lists and things like that, is actually to drive QS policy. Uh, what happens specifically for video, because video is so, so big volume-wise, you do need to be able to control the video to be able to say, this is how much bandwidth the video is limited to. Here are the needs that real-time video, for example, has of the network. Um, and here are the needs of all the different applications. So there's an RFC. It's called RFC 4594. It's an informational RFC, so it's not a standard, but it's a recommended it's a recommendation. And it's the same recommendation that we followed through on MediaNet. In fact, if you do a Google search on SRND and MediaNet, you'll find the design guide that has the configurations and things like that for um, for QS policies. And what we really recommend in this case, for example, is that uh, Cisco Telepresence, for example, would be marked as CS4. Uh, and then uh, uh, multimedia crossing would be marked as AF41 or AF42 in, in certain cases. Now, what comes out of all this stuff is that you can definitely mark your traffic this way. But then you can also choose to categorize, uh, as far as your QS policies are concerned, 
this is, I believe, this is probably 12 classes, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, yeah. So you don't need to have 12 classes in your QoS policy to be able to implement uh, QoS for MediaNet. You can choose to divide up your traffic into four classes, into six classes, eight classes, 12 classes. Sometimes it's a limitation of your service provider. Sometimes it's a limitation of your hardware. Uh, that's fine, except what we do really recommend is that you mark your traffic. You uh, put the DSCP values for these different types of traffic into these same values. That means when when you map them to your classes, you actually may have four different uh, of these different classes, in, uh, for, of these different markings into the same QoS class, which is fine, uh, because that's the limitation of that particular point in the network, and that and that might be fine for what you're trying to do at that particular point in time. But having the differentiated classification allows you the greatest flexibility for later on pulling off a portion of that traffic and being able to say, I'd like to control this at a more granular level within this particular class. Yeah, definitely, if you have questions, just you know, put them into the Q and A session and our. Um, great SMEs will be uh, are on are on hand to answer them. Now, as far as monitoring QoS, uh, there's a couple of different things that you can do over here. Inside of NetFlow, we can actually export both DSCP, but also the TOS field. So you can see if the marking is working properly for a particular flow. But there's also just to see how the QoS policies themselves are being applied. There's the CBQoS MIB. That's uh, available both for the switches as well as for the routers. And this tells you at a, at a QS class level how that particular class is performing. So in this case, we can see the voice over IP. Uh, here's how much traffic is going into that particular class, uh, 6.58 kilobits. And then uh, 153 bytes have been dropped. So that's a 2.3% drop. And coming out of that policy, here's how much traffic is, is making its way through. What this allows you to do is to build up a historical information base to be able to say, you know what, I, I'm, I've implemented call mission control for my voice over IP. I should really not be having any drops because no traffic should be able to get into the voice over IP class unless it's been approved by the CAC system. So if you're seeing drops there, then there's excess traffic getting in somehow, or somebody is sending more traffic than they're supposed to be sending. So it's a good way of finding out the performance of your QoS classes. And sometimes there's nothing wrong with that. It just may, perhaps means that it needs to be tuned. Or if it's something like class default, maybe it's actually the right thing to do that the traffic is being dropped. I mean, especially if it's something like a scavenger class, uh, there's generally some, nothing wrong with that traffic being dropped. But it does give you a good index of how the QS policies are performing and if there's anything that needs to be done to, to be able to um, slice and dice your traffic in a, in a different way or to be able to reconfigure your QS policies as well. Now, moving on to these new features. So the first new feature I really wanted to talk about is something called Performance Monitor. It's available both on the endpoints. So this would be the EX90s, the EX60s, um, uh, you know, the CTS endpoints and things like that. But it's also available within the routers and switches today. So the CAT3K, the 4K, the 6K, the ISR G1s and G2s, the ASR1000. And what this feature does is it looks at the traffic that's traversing the nodes and, and terminating at the endpoints and things like that. And it's able to look at TCP traffic. It's able to look at RTP traffic, which is used for voice over IP, but also used for video surveillance. It's also used for video conferencing. And we're able to tell you the health of that traffic. We're able to tell you at every single point of observation there's nothing wrong with that traffic. It's completely healthy traffic. So if somebody calls up and says, "There's some, I'm getting really poor quality, and the network is saying there's no packet loss, jitter is completely fine, you know that the problem is not within the network. It may be within the end system in itself. Now, in this particular diagram, I've got it, the feature deployed on every single node. That's not, I mean, you don't have to do that. Uh, the more that you have it deployed, the greater your granularity is going to be for your fault isolation domain. And what I mean by fault isolation domain is, let's say somewhere in the middle of your network, there's a problem, uh, and that could be within your service provider, it could be somewhere within your LAN environment, but let's say that there's a problem. Now, after that problem, there, the performance monitor will be able to detect the impairments, and it will be able to say that there's something wrong with this traffic. And the way the fault isolation works is, before the impairment, you, there's no problem. After the impairment, there is a problem. So. The more that you have this feature deployed, the smaller your scopes are going to be for your fault isolation. So generally, we recommend uh, to deploy Performance Monitor on the WAN edge, because what we found historically is that's generally where most of the problems occur. But you can choose to deploy this uh, where you're, a lot of times where people choose to deploy it is actually on their administrative domain boundaries, which may sometimes be actually on their LAN access switch 
or sometimes they're on their WAN edge switch, and sometimes on their international links and things like that. So um, not necessarily to deploy at every single point, uh, but the more that you deploy it, the greater granularity that you have. Now, once you have it deployed, you can choose to export this information via NetFlow. Uh, we also have a MIB, and you can choose to configure uh, local analysis for creating threshold crossing actions like an SNMP trap or a syslog if there's a violation. So I can say, look, I've got telepresence traffic. It's extremely sensitive to loss. Um, send an SNMP trap or a syslog if you ever see for telepresence traffic anything greater than 0.5% loss. All right, so in this particular case, you would have seen a syslog message from router number two and router number three. We've tested this feature out on a number of different platforms. It works for voice over IP things. It works for Cisco endpoints, for non-Cisco endpoints. Uh, obviously, when I talk about non-Cisco endpoints, I'm talking about the network side of Performance Monitor, not the MSI side. Uh, the MSI today is only available for Cisco endpoints. Uh, but it works fine for voice over IP, for video conferencing, for telepresence, for um, uh, video, uh, IPTV type stuff. Uh, also. If you have you know, one of these multi-screen telepresence units, we're even able to tell you the, that the left screen is having a problem versus the right screen. So channel by channel separation, that's the level of granularity that we can provide to you. Now in terms of time, the default is every 30 seconds there's a report generated. So we're able to tell you 30 seconds into a call that there's something wrong with that call. But generally when I talk with customers, they're, um, and this is sometimes embarrassing for them to admit, is they're waiting for that call from the actual user to tell them that there's something wrong. Otherwise, they have no they have no eyes and ears into their environment to be able to say that there's something wrong. So this provides you your eyes and ears, both from the endpoint, but also from your application point of view, that there's something wrong. And not only that there's something wrong, it's also able to tell you where that particular problem is. So the default is 30 seconds, but you can choose to uh, make it a lot more sensitive, uh, down to one second if you wanted to. As I said before, we can actually export this information via NetFlow. Uh, there's a number of different partners that we've uh, worked with on the NetFlow side. Uh, here's an output from, from live action. So what's kind of nice about the live action thing, um, a visualization is, is that it actually charts in a diagram. Well, it, it draws in a diagram um, how the flow is actually traversing the network. So it's able to say, look, this particular flow is coming from a CTS. It's going in, into gig 0 slash 0 and then it's going out gig 0 slash 0, and it's going to this other CTS. And while you can select these particular flows, it'll tell you the performance of that flow. It's able to tell you here's the percentage loss, here's the jitter values, here's how many megabits are being used for that particular flow. So all very intuitive, uh, extremely graphical. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about MediaTrace in a bit, but it, it works very, very nicely with MediaTrace. We do have a lab in RTP where we invite our partners. Uh, you, there's the, the address up at the top right-hand corner, so developer.cisco.com slash web slash mnet slash partners. And if you go to that website, we basically have uh, the, the, uh, you know, the, the feature usages and the, and the use cases that we tested these particular um, uh, network management partners against. And you can see that you know, this particular tool is really good for troubleshooting, for capacity planning, for fault isolation, those types of things. Okay. Now, I know I skipped over a slide. So, all right, so what I skipped over is I really wanted to talk about also just mention that we can also monitor multicast traffic, right? So sometimes multicast traffic is used for IPTV. Uh, sometimes it's used for video surveillance. Uh, note, it doesn't matter for performance monitor. From the network perspective, we can monitor the multicast traffic, same MIBs, same threshold crossing actions, same NetFlow type reports. It just happens to be for a multicast packet. Not a problem at all. As far as performance is concerned, this is mostly for your reference, but really on the high end, on the ASR1K, we can monitor anything from 600 megabits all the way to 8.3 gigabits of traffic. So this is all done in hardware. So in fact, on the ASR1K, the CPU hit for the 8.3 gigabits is about 2 to 3%. Um, on the lower end is the CAT3750. The traffic continues to be forwarded in hardware, so using the ASICs of the of the CAT3K for the forwarding, but the analysis is done in the CPU. So to monitor about 20 megabits of traffic, that sucks up about 30% of CPU. So generally, what we found is the CAT3K CPU is sitting idle because all the forwarding is done by the hardware. So we felt that it was, it was a good compromise to be able to 
use that much uh, CPU to be able to do that level of measurement. But what I would say is if you're going to go out and deploy it on a, on a CAT 3K, definitely look at your current utilization of CPU on the CAT 3K and just make sure you, you have that amount of CPU budget of headroom to be able to use that feature in that way. Now that said, um, the way performance monitor is configured, you can choose to select which traffic to monitor. So you don't have to monitor all the traffic. In fact, what we recommend is you select which traffic is the important one to monitor. Right, so you select, I'm going to monitor all EF traffic for my voice traffic, or I'm going to monitor CS4 traffic on this one particular port, uh, and, that, and that's it, basically. So you can choose to select how much um, traffic you're going to monitor on the front end as opposed to uh, just being, you know, opening yourself up to monitoring an arbitrary amount of traffic. Now, another feature then, part of MediaNet, is something called MediaTrace. And the idea, again, with MediaTrace is really we tried to improve on TraceRoute. Now, what MediaTrace is able to provide you, and this is available both on the endpoints as part of the EX90 and things like that, and it's, but it's also part of the routers and switches. So you can go into, um, let's say, a CAT3K. You can launch a MediaTrace, and it'll discover layer 2 nodes along the path. It'll discover layer 3 nodes along the path. So it's already ahead of TraceRoute in that way, because TraceRoute would have only told you about layer 3 nodes along the path, about the routers along the path. But MediaTrace will also tell you about the names of the interfaces for that particular flow that are being traversed. It'll tell you the speeds of those interfaces. It'll tell you the health of those interfaces, so number of, of runs, number of discards, you know, that type of stuff for that particular interface. But what I think is the coolest thing about MediaTrace is that it, will t it, it can dynamically enable performance monitor, that feature that looks at the user traffic. It can look at that traffic and it can tell you, look, there's something wrong with this particular flow on hop number two. So in this case, we ran MediaTrace from within the network. We ran it on starting from a 7200. So this is what's called a MediaTrace initiator. So the MediaTrace initiator can be any device along a path, even the endpoint. If the endpoint supports MediaTrace, you can do it from there. And it's saying, OK, I discovered hop number zero from hop number one. Um, I can tell you that the DSCP for this flow on hop number one was 34. And the jitter value for that flow that we were w wanting to troubleshoot was 6.6 .6 milliseconds and there was 0% loss. So there's no problem really, because 6.6 .6 milliseconds of jitter is nothing to really get worried about. Uh, so there's really nothing interesting going on in hop number one. So if there is a problem, it's probably after hop number one. Well, MediaTrace will do the walking for you. So it'll give you something from hop number zero, from hop number one, hop number two, hop number three, all the way to the endpoint. Uh, and if the endpoint supports uh, MediaTrace, then it will also respond back saying, look, here's how much I received this, this flow, and here's how much loss I had. Here's how much jitter value I had on the, on the consumption of this particular flow. So, so very exciting feature for us, because uh, we feel that it really allows us to accelerate that fault isolation portion. So rather than having to walk along a particular path, uh, it, it'll condense all that information and correlate it and bring it back all in one single screen. Now, uh, Live Action actually has an interface for MediaTrace, so you can do a right click on a flow and you can choose, well, I'd like to run, I see there's loss for this particular flow. Well, let me try to figure out where that loss is occurring. Where in the network is that loss occurring? So you can do that uh, MediaTrace. It runs the MediaTrace through the network, and it's able to tell you, look, um, there is no loss on this, uh, on this 2921, but on the link between the 2921 and the 1941, there is 1.6% loss. Right? There's no additional loss when it went to this 1921, to this uh, to the second 1921. So it tells you, okay, there's one problem so far between this 2921 and this 1941. But wait, there's another problem that's adding actually the the majority of the of the problem is actually between this second 2921 and the CAT3K, which is about 26% uh, loss. So when I was in the TAC, we used to have these problems all the time. It was like performance was like the worst type of problem that you could get from a customer because it's so, it's so hard to figure out where that performance problem is coming from. So a tool like this is able to tell you, A, of course, that there's a problem, but also the severity of that problem and where that severity is. So a general person may actually start you know, spending time and spending cycles on trying to solve this 2921 to 1941 problem. but the better effort would actually be to be spending time on this 2921 to CAT3K problem, because that's really where the problem's coming. That's really where the majority of the, of the situation is coming from. That's not to say, you know, this other problem, the 1.61, is nothing to laugh at, but I bet you that if you fix this 26% problem, the users would, would be a lot happier than versus the trying to solve this 1.6% problem. Okay. Now, 
what I saw from the poll from before is um, there was a lot of people that were doing evaluations for the existing polls, but a lot of you actually started out going out and doing deployments and things like that. But actually what I thought was surprising is that there's nobody who's actually stuck right now. You're moving ahead with the video deployments. Um, there's, there's some concerns and things like that, but you're making your way through it. Um, so, so that's actually very exciting uh, to hear that. And we're hoping that you can actually use these tools to further accelerate your video deployments, but also to be able to manage and to be able to do the fault isolations and provide basically a better service birth towards the network and also over to the application guys. Now, what this particular poll is about is trying to figure out, well, where does everybody stand with the different types of tools and technologies that are out there? So, um, you know, years and years ago, basically what I called um, the first type of monitoring is the MRTG or the cacti type monitoring. You're basically looking at individual interfaces, you're collecting them, and this is a great place to start. It lets you be able to create a historical trend line of how much that interface is being utilized. All right? And you can see like month by month, year by year, that here is the incremental usage of that particular interface. What's missing is, and what NetFlow actually provides you, is the composition of that traffic of who's talking to who and what, are the, what is the type of application that's you know um, hitting that particular wire because it may be sanctioned traffic it may be unsanctioned traffic it may be traffic that's uh, amiable to compression or to caching or you know or, or other types of optimization type techniques um, then there's the IPSLA measurements I, I know a lot of people that do the voice over IP deployments they they love the IPSLA jitter measurements so this is basically synthetic traffic uh, it could be a ping it could be a jitter probe but you're basically generating synthetic traffic to make measurements of the network and to be able to tell you from point A to point B, here's the amount of loss for this fake traffic, for this ping traffic, for, here's the amount of jitter from the jitter probes and things like that. Of course, we just talked about performance monitor, so that's very being able to look at the user traffic and to be able to assess loss versus the synthetic traffic. Um, and then there's media trace of being able to trace out a path and to be able to collect the information from those different things. And then finally, um, there's a dedicated probe model. So that's one thing that I didn't really talk about is what performance monitor allows you to do is basically bake in, essentially performance monitor is a type of probe into the network infrastructure. So everywhere where you have a router and such deployed, now you have the capability of having this very lightweight performance analysis of the user traffic that's going through it. So rather than having probes sitting, spanning traffic or replicating traffic off to, um, you know, only in your data center or in your big campuses, but you can have this at every single one of your branches. In fact, that's exactly what Cisco IT has done, is that we've deployed about um, uh, 20 to uh, 24,000 routers uh, in people's homes, part of the Cisco virtual office, so the part of the Tilly Worker project. And those routers, these are 880s and 890s, they've actually been enabled with both performance monitor and media trace. Now, Cisco IT, there is no way that we would have gone out and deployed 20,000 probes. But the fact that this is baked in to the routers and switches, it's just this turn is, um, you know, getting on the right software, turning this feature on, and then collecting that data, both historical, also real time, and to be able to do dynamic troubleshooting and things like that. Okay, so moving forward. Now, the last feature as part of the media monitoring work, uh, workflow is, is part of IPSLA. So there's a long history um, of IPSLA probe type. So uh, we talked a little bit about the jitter probe. We talked about the ICMP probe. That's the ping type. But there's a, a number of different other types of probes. You can actually generate fake TCP traffic. So you can do like a TCP connection to a service or even an HTTP connection to a specific URL. And you can measure how long it takes for the router or, t or the switch to download a particular web file or something like that. Uh, we can even generate uh, fake Edge.323 or SIP traffic. Now, the newest thing that we added was something called the video probe. And what the video probe does is it generates fake, realistic video traffic. And what I mean by that is it's not coming from the actual application, but it looks like it's coming from an application. And, and when I say an application, we need to be very specific here because uh, it comes prepackaged with an IPTV, a video surveillance, and a CTS profile. So it has the same packet size distribution, it has the same bit rate, it has the same pack, packet rate um, as an actual CTS endpoint would have. So that's six megabits. So imagine, you know, and in the case of the CAT3K, you can generate a total of 20 megabits of fake traffic. So imagine putting, you know, three telepresence units on, uh, pretend telepresence units behind the CAT3K and having the CAT3K basically stress the network in the same way as that particular application would have. 
We do have a utility. It's up on uh, Cisco.com. Uh, there's a link later on in, in the resources section. Uh, it's a Windows utility. You download it. You can feed it a packet capture. You know, using you can do that packet capture doing TCP dump or Wireshark. You feed that packet capture over to the Windows utility. It'll analyze your application's traffic, which could be a polycom. It could be a WebEx transaction or your VDI transaction. It doesn't even have to be video. That's the best part about this. It doesn't even have to be video. It'll analyze that traffic and it will understand the, the same the same characteristics, the burstiness, the traffic size distribution, packet rate, bit rate, all that stuff. And then it will spit out a profile file. And you can take that profile file, load it up to your Cat3K, and now your Cat3K can pretend to be 10 VDI sessions and one telepresence session. Right? And now you can stress test your network, run through that what-if scenario, You've done the spreadsheet math. You know that you have 10 megabits or 5 megabits at that particular branch, right? But this is not about spreadsheet math. This is about do you actually have the proper QoS policies in place? Are you able to protect your business traffic from this new from this new application traffic? Are are you able to protect your video traffic from the business traffic? Right? And sometimes what happens is that you may be paying for 5 megs, but you're not actually getting all of the 5 megs. So this is another way of sort of stressing that network in that same way. And think about that you're able to, from a network perspective, get running with an application deployment even before the application guys show up on the perimeter of the network and start adding their applications in. What we've found a lot of times when you know when talking with deployment engineers is that you know the, the network guys go through a lot of trouble of doing the right QS policies, uh, all the spreadsheet math, and making sure that the network is ready. But there's really no way to know until you finally get the application at that particular branch and they start using it and that's when all the all the support calls start coming in but there's there's poor quality there's packet loss there's something wrong with, with, with the network this is a, a sort of a way of getting ahead of all that of running through those uh, cycles beforehand before the actual application is deployed so that's one case of using IPS live video operation the other case of using IPS live video operation is you've done the deployment but you like to be able to do um, periodic tests of the network. Because it's the same traffic every single time, you would expect that the response from the network would be the same every single time. So you run it today, you run it tomorrow, a week from now, a month from now, you shouldn't expect the results to be different. And you could try doing this with a video endpoint, uh, but we all know that, you know, what gets thrown onto a wire for a video endpoint depends on who's in front of the camera. So if you have a clown in front of the camera, he's going to be jumping around doing cartwheels and all that type of stuff. Uh, that's going to have a different footprint on the wire, a very bursty, a very big traffic volume versus uh, calling into an empty room, all the lights are off, you're going to get amazing video compression, but the stress to the network is not going to be the same as the clown. So video operation is the baseline level of traffic every time. So let's talk about these pulls. So it looks like the majority of you, 60%, um, have NetFlow deployed. So that's amazing. So, so I think that's really good. I used to be the NetFlow uh, de uh, deployment engineer, uh, deployment engineer, technical marketing engineer, and NetFlow is a great tool. And you're just one step away from performance monitor. And I see like four percent of you are already using uh, performance monitor. So uh, performance monitor has a number of different interfaces. It has a MIB, but we can actually continue doing um, your NetFlow deployment. Just add a couple of extra fields that include things like packet loss and jitter and, and things like that. And and, and you sort of close that gap between just basic NetFlow and the sort of performance monitoring enabled NetFlow. The other thing that's uh, so slightly relate, um, not related to video operation, but just basic IPSLA, very recently in the last few months, we actually added the capability of being able to test multicast with um, IPSLA. So you can choose to have an IPSLA generator, same way you have today, but it will generate. It will create a multicast tree composed of IPSLA receivers, and these guys will dynamically join the tree. They'll they'll do the IGMP joins, the PIM joins, all that stuff. They'll create the tree based on what you configured dynamically. You will send out, uh, for example, a jitter probe, and it will test the performance of that tree. Are you losing packets for that tree for all these receivers that you've set up? What's the one-way delay? What's the jitter value? So all that information you can chart out for a, for a hypothetical multicast tree. What would be the performance like? It'd be like once you're done with the test, it'll bring down that tree and you're back to a, a stateless uh, um, state, stateless multicast. So there's no more multicast inside. At least there's no um, multicast tree within the network. So this is a very new feature. It just came out a few months back. So over the next over the next year, we'll be adding video operation support to this. So today it would be just like a few packets sending down that multicast tree and making the measurements on the receiver side. 
Um, over the next year or so, we'll also have the ability of generating, uh, creating realistic traffic workloads and sending those down the tree itself. So for IPSLA, uh, again, a number of different partners already support this. We've got them documented on the on the website. But also for the live action case, you can actually, it, it's kind of cool because you have this, in live action, you have this network topology and you can choose what I'd like to run um, fake traffic between endpoint A and endpoint B. And it'll, um, you can choose that graphically and then after that, it'll it'll draw, here's where the traffic is going through and then it'll show you the um, the output. Uh, what I don't remember is, uh, uh, Ray, I don't know if you can uh, speak, speak in, uh, if you can actually do a media trace on that IPSLA uh, video traffic within a live action. I think Ray might have, might have stepped up. But that's the other thing that you can actually do with the IPSLA video operation traffic. Um, it's close enough to actual video traffic. It looks like RTP traffic. So you can choose to run performance monitor and media trace on that traffic itself. right? Um, and I think live action have this. I, I remember doing it at one point. You can actually do a right click on that fake flow, choose to do a media trace, and if IPS live video operation is telling you that there's something wrong with that flow, you'll be able to do the fault isolation. You'll be able to tell where exactly in the network the problem is coming from. Okay. Uh, that's, that's pretty much what that traffic was about. So um, just sort of wrapping up, so the things to the things that you can do, um, we've got some resources up on the web. So uh, depending on what type, what your role is, there's different types of tools that are available to you. If you're familiar with the Gold Lab from Cisco, you can access those. Uh, it's on an ISR G2 as well as on an ASR 1K. So there's a lab over there. There's a service from Cisco Advanced Services. They'll come in and they'll do a survey um, uh, with your management, with yourself about what your aspirations are as far as video is concerned. And then they'll audit the network and your applications and tell you the delta of where you are today from where you want to be able to go. And it may not be an investment that you need to make inside the network. It may be just a resetting of expectations of what you, of what you want to be able to do with how much of a change that you're able to live with. Uh, we also have the media net knowledge base, so a whole bunch of deployment guides, uh, quick start guides, um, uh, design guides, all sorts of information over there. And if you're familiar with the SBA, the Smart Business Architecture, so very, very uh, to the point configs, uh, templates and things like that. So there's a link over there as well for the SBA architecture for MediaNet. And then we also maintain a blog um, uh, on the internet from all the new things that are coming out from MediaNet, recent events and things like that. So definitely, you know, subscribe to that, check us out. Um, you know, leave comments on things you like, definitely things that you don't like. Uh, we'd love to hear from both sides of, the, of that site. So uh, as far as MediaNet is concerned, just keep in mind that it's both on the endpoints so those endpoints are comprised of things like WebEx, the digital media player, the video surveillance cameras. It's part of Java for Windows. Uh, it's actually part of Cisco's VDI solutions. You're familiar with the VXC. So that includes the MSI as well. So there's certain capabilities that are in there today. And there's going to be even more moving forward, like monitoring and, and the other stuff that we've talked about that's now available on the EX90s and things like that. Over the next year or so, you'll, you'll see things coming out for third-party endpoints like Citrix, Zen Server, and Zen Desktop. And on the network side, we support uh, these features all the way from you know the small 800 series that are part of Cisco's Teleworker program all the way up to an ASR 1000. So it's, a, it's part of the CAT 6K, the, the CAT 4K, the CAT 3K, as well as the CAT 2K. There's a data sheet. Um, in the URL portion, uh, we'll make the PDF and the recording available. But in the in the data sheet, it actually lays out which specific software versions are needed. Uh, generally, there's no additional licensing. There's no MediaNet license for the routers and switches. Uh, for example, on the ISR G2, performance monitor and media trace are built into the data license. Right, so there's new license. There's not a new license. It's just we're just putting these features into existing licensing. And depending on which platform that you have. Uh, generally, what we find is most people are already on these particular types of, um, of this licensing. Okay. So I'm pretty much done. So back to you, Ray. Great. Thanks very much, Amr. Before we go, it looks like we have a, actually a couple of questions here. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. How do I get started with a MediaNet deployment? Yep. So. So it, it depends on how how exciting you want your life to be. So we, we have um, so so, the, so there's a quick start guide. It's up on CCO. So it's in the resources tab, uh, in, in the resources slide. But if you just do a Google search for quick start and MediaNet, it basically lays out. Well, here's the bomb, the bill of materials that you need for your sample lab, and it's all free stuff 
for the most part. And you can always download like a, a, an evaluation license for Action Pact for live action. Um, but there's also tools that you need to do for you know, network impairments and things like that. So there's links to those things. But it basically lays out here's the minimum topology that you would want to have. Um, test it out in a lab, get comfortable with it. And and then generally where we start, you know, the, the best place to start with, with the monitoring solutions, first of all, is really on the WAN edge. So the ISRs and the ASRs. So whatever is on your WAN edge, um, that's generally where a lot of the problems are, and that's really where you want to start your monitoring. But what we've had people also do is um, also start on the on the access side. So we've got a customer that's monitoring um, a via traffic, and we've got another customer that's monitoring link traffic on Cat3Ks. All right, so they're wa so they're watching basically link traffic coming in from their application group into the network perimeter, and there's and and this is the network guys doing this because they're just they they want to be able to say, look when your link traffic or your Avaya traffic entered my domain, it was already compromised. It was already impaired. So there's no network problem. Um, right? So, and I've been able to verify that using you know, performing monitor on the Cat3K. So generally on the borders of the administrative domains. Now, so that's one way. So if you want your life to be really, really exciting, you get to have a lot of fun in the lab and things like that and get your hands dirty. The other way is we do have a service from Advanced Services. It's called the MRA, the Media readiness assessment and this is uh, what they'll do is advanced services will come in they'll they'll take a, they'll do a survey they'll do interviews with the network folks the application folks um, the business folks um, about you know what the goals and aspirations of of a video deployment what does that actually mean to you and from that point on they'll do a network survey a network assessment using their own tools and things like that and they'll, and they'll deliver basically a report here's how here's basically a step-by-step -step guide of where you want to go based on on your strategic vision for, for using video Great, thank you. Um, I think we have maybe time for one more question, if you don't mind. These are great tools, but how do I justify the business value? Yep, so so this is a really good question, uh, because sometimes what happens is that we sort of get stuck in, like, uh, on the network side, we, like, we have all this great data, but we don't know how to you know, justify the cost of going out the deployment, even if it's just a software upgrade. You still need to justify the time and investment in, in learning the feature and things like that. So we've had a number of customers that um, that have created models, and if if you send us an email, we can send we can send you that model. And I mean, forget about the numbers that are inside the model, but look about look at the composition of the model. Here's the amount of time that you would have saved if you were using MediaNet services. I was talking to the customer a couple of weeks back, and they said, look, if I had MediaTrace, this QS assessment, this QS checking that I'm that I'm supposed to be doing, that's going to take me two months. But with MediaTrace, I know I can get done with that in a week. So think about the amount of time that you would save with, with the utilization of these tools. Now, think about if something was actually broken. Think about the amount of time and of service uptime that you'd be able to get back. Right, so, uh, and this is why I was talking about some of these services becoming business critical. So if it's a business critical service, like a video conferencing service, or if you're in a call center and, and you know, having the call center being down is a very serious thing, these tools can actually uh, lower the cost of, you know, maintaining the call center and things like that. Now, the other side of this is that there's other customers that are actually using these services to be able to, uh, get greater bandwidth for video by moving over to the PSTN, I'm sorry, to the public internet, right? And the concern with the public internet a lot of times has been, look, these links are unreliable, this, that, and the other. Well, this, this, these test set of tools basically provide you a way to uh, not guarantee service, but to be able to provide troubleshooting assistance and to be able to do triage, to be able to say, look, I'm getting business class cable modem service. Uh, it's still over the internet. It's not as good as my managed services from you know, X provider or something like that, but it's a lot more bandwidth for the same price. All right, so that allows you to uh, open up that bottleneck with, uh, versus the price versus bandwidth question, but it also provides you a level of confidence of being able to provide support and be able to do triage and troubleshooting for that um, unmanaged link, for example. So these are just two examples. Yeah, by the way, guys, I did post in, uh, in the chat window uh, an email address you can ask to um, ask us any questions related to MediaNet. That's ask-medianet at cisco.com. Thank you, Patricia. Yeah, thank you, Patricia. And, and folks, that was Patricia Costa, who also um, provided to, with her time today. So thanks, Patricia, for joining us. Problem. My pleasure. Um, well, that's the end of our presentation. Um,
You know, during uh, the uh, informative session that Amar was uh, going through, he also mentioned, you know, um, live action media trace, RPS, LVO, and performance monitoring. So if anyone is interested in a, a free trial of live action, here's the contact information and URL, uh, which is www.actionpack.com, live action download. So if you're interested in that or want a free demonstration, please contact Steve and or Keith. So uh, again, thank you everyone for joining us. We appreciate your time, Amr and, and Patricia. Thank you as well as well as the rest of your team who um, provided us with some key information for our audience today. So uh, again, the uh, the webinar video and presentation will be available. Uh, we will be circling back with everyone here via an email when it's up and posted. But in, in the meantime, thank you again for joining us and have a great action-packed day. Hello, everyone.